Hello and welcome back to uh, Eastridge Church Men's Bible Study called Clear Future and we are on week four and tonight and today or tonight we're going to talk about the tribulation uh, as we look at the end time events and um, I've got a lot of ground to cover a seven year period with a lot of stuff happening happening uh, and uh, and a little time to do it I'm trying to get this done in about 30 to 40 minutes here so uh, we're going to dive right in and ask God to uh, bless our time together. Hopefully you've downloaded the notes, you're ready to go, and, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a, a great lively discussion in your groups afterwards as well. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise that we will be raptured and will not, as believers, go through the wrath that is, that is to come. And as we study uh, the pouring out of your wrath upon this broken, sinful world, and you as a just God bringing all things right. We pray and thank you, Lord, for your grace. And we pray, Lord, that uh, this will motivate us to live lives as your uh, followers, to occupy till you come, and to do the work that you've called us to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the tribulation. Well, what is, first of all, the tribulation? And you can take that word, the term, tribulation, and it simply means pressure, either literal or figural, figurative pressure or affliction or anguish or other words uh, that are synonymous with the word tribulation, that you're burdened, that you're persecuted, that you're going through trouble. And it can refer to anything from just the daily trials of life uh, to more severe trials, including even persecution for the faith. But we're going to talk about what is referred to as the tribulation and even in some cases referring to the last half of that time period, the great tribulation. It's derived from several scriptures, uh, Daniel, the Gospels, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, Revelation, other prophets refer to this time. And we're going to look at it. It's a seven-year period. We'll explain why it's seven years in a moment. Uh, but uh, let's uh, take a look at a couple of verses that refer to this tribulation or great tribulation. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, At that time there shall be a time of trouble or tribulation, such, notice, as never has been since there was a nation till that time. So it's separate from other uh, daily trials, severe persecutions, anything that is ever experienced, there will be a time that there will be a great tribulation on the earth. Matthew 24, 21 says this, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So it will be unique, it will be intense, it will be greater than any other tribulation up to that point. There's other designations in uh, Scripture. Uh, doesn't use the actual terminology of uh, the tribulation or the great tribulation but in the old testament the most common reference to this time period uh, is is the day of the lord the day of the lord daniel refers to it and we'll look at this in detail in just a second he re he refers to it as the 70th week uh, isaiah <coughs> and zephaniah talk about the day of vengeance or the the day of wrath when speaking of this time period and then in Thessalonians, uh, Paul says, calls it the wrath that is to come. And in Revelation, it's referred to as the wrath of God or the hour of judgment. Actually, there are many, many more references to this time period using different terminology, but it gives you the idea of tribulation, wrath, vengeance, judgment. Um, so let's take a look at the events. What's going to happen during this tribulation Period. And the first thing is there's going to be a, an event that begins this time period, an inaugural event. And uh, I want to take you to Daniel chapter 9, first of all, before I give you what happens there. Let's t Daniel chapter 9. Let's start with verse 24 uh, and read through verse 27. Daniel says, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks 
It shall be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. And after, 60, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one uh, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Verse 27. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. All right. So you see these references to weeks. Uh, seven weeks. Uh, a week is uh, uh, used here in the terminology of Daniel to represent uh, seven years, each day being a year. So seven, a week would be seven years. Uh, and so when he says seven weeks, that means seven groups of seven years, which would be 49 if my math uh, doesn't fail me. Uh, and so he says there's going to be this seven-week period, which is 49 years, and then 62 weeks. So it would be 62 groups of seven years which adds up to 424 years uh, for the 62 weeks. All told, all 69 weeks is 483 years. Now, why do I mention this? Uh, well, there is a doctor by the name of Dr. David Cooper, a theologian, and he used the Bible's method of counting regular solar years from the creation of Adam, and he determined that from the year of the decree of Cyrus, the Persian, to permit the Jews who were captive in Babylon to go back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. You remember Ezra and Nehemiah, that's that time period. Uh, from that time until the time that Jerusalem was rebuilt was 49 years. And 434 years later, or 69, 62 weeks, the Messiah was cut off. He was crucified. So from the time of the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the time of Jesus' crucifixion was 434 years, which equals that 62 weeks. So he's saying there that the, the 69 weeks ha have been fulfilled through Christ's crucifixion on the cross. Well, connected with that 69th week in Daniel's vision, he says the Messiah will be cut off. Following that, at some point, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The question is, who is this prince? Well, we looked at it last week. Uh, the prince that is to come is the Antichrist. It couldn't be Christ because uh, he's already f referred to in the uh, of being cut off and, and crucified. Uh, but so there's this 70th week, one more week to come. And that week is a seven year period. And that's what we're referring to here in scripture is referring to the great tribulation that's going to take place. Uh, the Antichrist, so the number one uh, inaugural event, if you're taking notes, fill this in, is that the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel. Uh, he will enter into a covenant of peace with Israel, uh, and, uh, and that will allow Israel to have opportunity to worship in the temple, uh, to bring their sacrifices, their grain offerings, and uh, they'll have relative peace. But something happens midway through that, uh, that seven-year period, so three and a half years in, uh, the Antichrist is going to abolish temple worship, and he's going to abolish all the sacrifices, and then he's going to commit what we looked at last week, the abomination of desolation, uh, and that is an act of where he will sit on the throne in the temple and declare himself to be God, which would be a desecration of the temple, and uh, that peace covenant or treaty will be destroyed at that point. And it enters into, as we go to the book of Revelation now, uh, a series of events, judgments, that will, that will be unfolded upon the earth. Um, and so uh, this is what's going to happen in the seven-year period. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to uh, work our way through this. I want you to understand, though, that when we look at these uh, seven seal judgments, and seal is not the animal. Seal is the, uh, uh, the like on a scroll. You pull back the seal to un unleash the scroll or unroll the scroll. Uh, the seven seal judgments, 
Then there are seven trumpet judgments, according to Revelation, and there are seven bowl judgments or vile judgments. Uh, and we're going to look at all of those uh, uh, in this study. But I want you to get this picture, is that as the seven seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, once the seventh seal is open, the seventh seal unleashes then the seven trumpets. So the seventh seal uh, introduces us and rolls right into the seven trumpet judgments. We're going to look at those. Then the seventh trumpet uh, unveils and opens up the seven uh, bowl judgments. So it's seals, trumpets, bowls. We're going to look at all of those, and those contain the events and the judgments of God upon the face of the earth during the tribulation. And I'll just stop and say, we took time two weeks ago to talk about the rapture of the church, that uh, we will be delivered from the wrath that is to come. We, will be, we won't, as believers, go through the tribulation. Can we just stop and say, before we even look at it, thank you, Jesus, uh, for your grace, for your salvation, for your redemption, that we will not have to go through these events. But it will be good for us to know what will happen, uh, and uh, it should uh, motivate us to live pure and holy lives now and motivate us to do everything that we can to share the gospel with others. So let's dive in. Uh, to the seven seal judgments, starting in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now I watched when the land opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So this first seal is described as a white horse, and uh, who is this one riding on the white horse? Well, most scholars believe that this is referring to who we looked at last week, the Antichrist. So fill that in. The Antichrist is the one riding that white horse. And he will appear on the scene in this tribulation period at the very beginning. And he's going to use diplomacy and the promise of peace. Remember, he enters into a covenant with Israel. Uh, and he's going to do this to establish on earth a one world government and he will be the one world ruler that's the uh, that's the intent of the antichrist so that's the first seal the second seal we see in verses three to four of chapter six as he opened the second seal i heard the second living creature say come and out came another horse bright red so we have a red horse in the second seal and <coughs> its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slay one another and he was given a great sword so the second seal introduces this massive war that's going to take place because uh, peace will be taken from the earth there will no longer be peace on earth and people will be slaying one another it'll just be mass warfare on the face of the earth in this second seal judgment and then we come to verses 5 and 6 of chapter 6 which is the third seal and we see a black horse and notice here it says, uh, this black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. What's this talking about? This is talking about a great famine that's going to take place. So the black horse represents famine. We have the Antichrist, this is the white horse, Red horse is war. The black horse is famine. There will be suffering of famine on the earth, which is a direct result of war. And there will be great inflation. Did you notice the scales and the, the amounts of dollars for uh, ver various basic necessities? Uh, there will be intense inflation and famine as the aftermath of that second seal war, which is the third seal, famine. The fourth seal in verses 7 and 8 represents a pale horse and that pale horse write this in represents death let's look at it he said i opened the fourth seal heard the voice of the fourth living creature say come and i looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and hades followed him and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth so you have here <coughs> This uh, um, fourth seal is a pale horse, and as a result of all war, there's death. Uh, but in this case, it's an incredible uh, amount of death. 
a fourth of the population and living creatures will be destroyed uh, during this judgment. Uh, by today's population standards, that would amount to over uh, uh, one and a half billion people that would be destroyed uh, as a result of this war and, and death that would take place on the earth. It's incredible to think about it. All right, so that was the fifth seal, or the fourth seal. The fifth seal is found in verses 9 to 11. And it says, When I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers would be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. This passage introduces us to the martyrdom of those who are converted to Christ during the tribulation period. You say, how were they converted to Christ? We're going to look at this in a moment, but there was the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses uh, described in Revelation 7. And as they go out and, and declare that Jesus is, in fact, the true Messiah, there will be people who profess faith in Christ during the tribulation period, an innumerable amount of people, the Bible says. And, uh, and because of this, they will be martyred uh, by the government leader and by what is referred to as the harlot. We'll look at this also a little bit closer. Uh, that's described in, verse, in Revelation 17. The harlot represents uh, this false religious system. Uh, and the harlot gets her power from the Antichrist. And so these people will be martyred. And it, it tells us, first of all, that evangelism during this time period is back in the hands of the Jews. The 144,000 witnesses um, are, are Jews. And, and since the church is absent, we've been raptured. Uh, the 144,000, along with what we'll look at in a moment, the two witnesses, uh, will be the ones doing the evangelizing, and many people will come to faith in Christ during this time period. We come to the sixth seal now. It's found in verses 12 to 17 of Revelation. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but basically summarize it for you, that the wrath of God is going to be poured out in the form of a mighty, mighty earthquake. Uh, and it's going to be bigger than any earthquake we've ever seen or experienced uh, I tell you, I've, I've experienced a few earthquakes. The, the strongest one I experienced, I remember the date to the exact date because it was on my wife's 30th birthday. I won't give you that date for her sake. Uh, but on her 30th birthday, we were living in Oregon, and I had gotten up. Uh, it was early in the morning. I'd gotten up, just gotten into the bathroom, getting ready to take my shower and get ready for the day. And it sounded like, to me, I heard the earthquake before I felt it, it sounded like the washer machine had gotten off. You know how that, that wah, 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 wah sound? That's what it sounded like. And what that was was the, the door to the, the glass door to the, to the um, shower was rattling and making that sound. And, and as I'm trying to gain my bearings and know what's going on, Lizette rushes in and says, what are you doing? She thought I was making the noise. And then I said, we're having an earthquake. And so we start to go out of our room to check on the kids and, uh, and it wasn't long after that that it had stopped. I'm glad that it was not long, uh, but things were definitely shaking. Uh, my son slept through the whole thing, didn't even know it. My daughter was a little afraid, and one of her uh, precious moment ornaments uh, fell off the window seal and broke, and that was her great tragedy. Uh, but uh, it was uh, unsettling, and that was just a small uh, earthquake. That was... Uh, I think in the area of five point something uh, that experienced at that time. I can't remember the exact uh, level of intensity. But this is going to be uh, an earthquake that is going to be bigger than any we have ever experienced. It is going to be an earthquake where uh, so severe that people, the, the, the passage here says that people will cry out for the rocks to fall on them and, and kill them because they're so terrified. We come now to the seventh seal, and that is found in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. And I want you to notice something in Revelation 8. Uh, it says, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Isn't that amazing? That in heaven will be 
30 minutes, about a 30 minutes of silence. And I saw the angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. <clears throat> and another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer, notice, with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So remember, this seventh seal, uh, we're told that we get a picture of what's happening in heaven as this is being un. Folded, is there's going to be 30 minutes of silence uh, but it's going to introduce now remember the seven seals the seventh trumpet introduces now the unfolding of of the seven trumpet judgments so let's dive into those verse 7 of chapter 8 is the first trumpet and we see in verse 7 that the first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood and those were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So write this down. Hail, fire, and blood. It'd be a major catastrophe. Uh, is going to fall on the face of the earth, and it says a third of all vegetation, trees, grass, the earth, will be destroyed. An incredible event, horrifying event, I'm sure. And then we find the second trumpet in Revelation 8, eight and nine and we hear about this great mountain of fire that is going to destroy a third of all write this in sea life every sea creature all the living creatures in the sea a third of the sea will be destroyed by this event the second trumpet judgment then we find in verses 10 and 11 a third trumpet and let's read that verses 10 and 11 it says i took uh or excuse me <coughs> I jumped ahead a chapter there. They, um, chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven. This could, be, this could possibly be a meteor. We don't know. But a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and, and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood, uh, which means bitter. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. So we have this third trumpet, the great star Wormwood, will destroy a third of the rivers and, um, and the fountains of, of, the, uh, of the earth. So there will be uh, destruction, and, and the water will become bitter. Can you imagine uh, if, uh, if water was uh, contaminated? Uh, the death and the destruction that would, would come upon uh, the people and the earth that would be uh, millions of people will die during this time period. We find in verse 12 that one-third, uh, this is the fourth trumpet in chapter 8, verse 12, one-third of the sun, the moon, and the stars will be darkened. Okay, so a third of the sun, a third of the moonlight, a third of the stars lighting up, and it will result in darkness third of darkness on the face of the earth and uh, that will also be uh, a terrifying and, and and difficult time as well then go then we go into the fifth trumpet and that's found in uh, revelation chapter 9 verses 1 to 12 for sake of time i'm not going to read it but it's there for you to read on your own but basically these demonic uh looking like as john said in his uh, description remember he is Looking ahead, he's seeing things ahead that he hasn't experienced or have, has a word for even. He's describing them as like uh, scorpions and locusts, he said. And these, these demon-like creatures that look like scorpions and locusts, they come out of the bottomless pit, he tells us there in Revelation 9. So we know that they're demonic in nature. And there aren't, they aren't allowed or able to kill people. Uh, but instead, they will torture them so severely and so badly that uh, people, it says, will, will seek death, but they cannot find it. Can you imagine hurting and being tortured so bad that you want to die, but you can't die? You have to just live in incredible pain and torture. That is the fifth trumpet judgment. The sixth trumpet judgment is found in Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 to 21. And uh, what we have 
are 200 million because there's a there's a phrase in there uh, I think it's twice 10,000 times 10,000 I think that's the phrase I, I would have to look at it again uh, but uh, it adds up to 200 million death angels basically angels uh, death angels that will be sent out upon the face of the earth and this passage tells us that during the sixth trumpet judgment one-third of the population will be killed now there's a lot of population being killed right so uh, as you add it up it'll bring us to nearly 50 percent of the world's population at that time during the tribulation will have been destroyed before the midpoint of the tribulation we haven't even gotten to the midpoint of the seven years yet uh, and the people that will be destroyed are those who have taken the mark of the beast. We'll talk about that in just a moment as well. Before we go to the seventh trumpet, I want to pause and talk about, in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 to 14, it speaks of two witnesses. And what do these two witnesses do? Write down this word. They prophesy, they preach, they proclaim the gospel. And they do so for 1,260 days. Basically, the first three and a half years uh, of the tribulation Basically, everything that we've covered up to now, at the same time that all these events are happening, there's two witnesses uh, that uh, are real people. Uh, that the Bible says that they'll have miraculous powers that they'll be able to, uh, to employ, much like Moses and Elijah says. Uh, they will preach. They will witness uh, during this first half of the tribulation. And it's quite possible during their preaching and prophesying, that's how the 144,000 Jews are converted and sealed and saved and they go out preaching and evangelizing as well that's how you have the saints that will be martyred uh, during the tribulation now to me this is amazing <clears throat> because as a dreadful as a time this will be it tells us that god is faithful he's faithful to provide a, a, a presentation and a preaching of the gospel an opportunity by grace to all the nations even though he's in the process as a just God of having to punish sin and destroy the works of the enemy. And so God is still reaching out in the midst of the tribulation because he loves people and he wants them in relationship to him. So it comes to the seventh trumpet now, and that's found in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And basically what happens with the seventh trumpet is it introduces a lot of events. Uh, those events happen through chapters 12 through 18 in Revelation. And uh, we're going to kind of do a quick survey of those uh, in just a second. But it also, as I said, remember the seventh seal introduced the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet unfolds the seven bowl judgments, which will be the, the most severe and final judgments upon the face of the earth during the tribulation. So we're entering now into the last three and a half years, what many refer to the whole of the seven years as the tribulation, the last three and a half years as the Great Tribulation. Uh, what are some of those events that begin to unfold? Well, let me just quickly, I'll give you some references. They're not in your notes. You can write these down. But in Revelation 17, uh, there's a description of, and I referred to it earlier, as a false religious system called the harlot. Uh, and this, this will be a merging of all the religions of the world during the first half of the Tribulation. And this religious system called the harlot will be so powerful that initially it will dominate the Antichrist and the Ten Kings. Uh, but because of their hatred for this religious system called the harlot, at the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, they'll make war on her and kill her. So there will be a destruction of this uh, false religious system halfway through the tribulation. Uh, in the process of doing this, you might remember last week we talked about that the... Uh, the Antichrist will receive um, uh, what appears to be a mortal wound, appear to die, and, um, and that wound is healed, uh, John's vision tells us. Uh, and we also know that in Revelation 12, we, we touched on this briefly, but there's going to be a war in heaven, and uh, Satan and his demons will be cast out of the atmosphere, out of the universe. They're going to be confined to the earth. Uh, and you can imagine how uh, things are going to intensify in terms of evil and what's going on. And uh, when that happens, Satan actually himself will enter the body of the Antichrist and, uh, and possess and manipulate from that point forward so that the Antichrist will have even a, 
a, a new and even more vicious life uh, in this second half of the tribulation. Uh, he's going to the Antichrist. He's going to force the remaining people on the earth. We find this out in Revelation 13 as well. Uh, force them to begin to worship him. Uh, and uh, the only ones who won't worship him are those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So those saints who come to know Christ during the tribulation, just by their patient endurance, they'll have to endure it all. Uh, but uh, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They will not worship the beast or the Antichrist. Now, in place of that false religious system, the harlot that will be destroyed, there will come another one called the false prophet. And he will emerge as a replacement for that religious system. And he's going to enforce the worship of the Antichrist and his image. Um, and if people don't, they will be killed. In fact, they will need to take on what is known as the mark of the beast. Uh, the mark is 666, it tells us in John's visions uh, in Revelation. And they'll either need to take it on their, uh, uh, their the top of their hand, their forehand, or their forehead. And um, uh, that mark will allow people, if they take that mark, to uh, get a job, hold a job, be able to buy and sell, it says, to be able to actually basically live and function on the earth. They will need this mark. And, uh, <coughs> of course, you know that we're, we're headed, headed to the final battle. And so uh, it now begins the seven bowl judgments. Let's quickly go through those, uh, and, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. The first bowl uh, is found in Revelation 16, 1 and 2. And this, during this bowl judgment, uh, painful sores will be unleashed on uh, people who have rejected Christ and have accepted the mark of the beast instead and are worshiping the Antichrist. And so... There will be painful sores that will break out on the bodies of those who reject Christ. Second bowl judgment is found in verse 3 of Revelation 16. And it tells us there that the entire sea will turn to blood. Can you imagine that? How vast the seas and the oceans are. And that every living creature in the sea will die. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the judgments... And the severity have ratcheted up incredibly uh, when the entire sea is turned to blood. The third bowl is found in Revelation 16.4. And that's where we find that the rivers and the lakes uh, and the springs of the earth are turned to blood as well. So think of this. The water sources are all blood now. Uh, the fourth bowl found in Revelation 16.8 and 9 tells us that there will be fierce heat from the sun, it will become so intense that uh, the ungodly will not turn, they won't turn in repentance to God. In fact, it will further infuriate them and they will blaspheme the name of the Lord in the midst of this suffering. Uh, and the fifth bowl is in Revelation 16 10 through 11, and that's where darkness will cover the throne of Antichrist and his kingdom. Uh, sores will continue. They'll produce such agony that it says men will uh, gnaw their tongues in pain and they will blaspheme God and they will refuse to repent. Isn't that remarkable? After all of this, uh, they're still refusing to repent and turn to God. And you know if they do, they would be delivered. They would, at the end of the tribulation, just like the martyred saints, would be resurrected and, uh, and raptured to be joined with the church uh, and uh, uh, but they're refusing to repent. We come now to the sixth bowl. is found in Revelation 16, 13 through 16, and that's where demonic spirits who lie and deceive are going to be unleashed on the earth, and they're going to bring the kings of the earth to this place called Armageddon. And so write this in. It'll actually set the stage for the battle of Armageddon. These lying spirits will be bringing these kings uh, to uh, this battle of Armageddon. I tell you, it was a sobering time, even though at the time that we were with Pastor Steve and Cheryl in Israel, uh, it was a sandstorm. It was really kind of foggy, much like it is today or this morning as I'm recording this, but uh, it uh, couldn't, couldn't see the finest detail, but you could make out enough of the, this valley of Megiddo uh, where this bloody final battle take place. We're going to look at that next week in a little more detail 
as we talk about Christ's actual coming back to earth, his second coming. And then we come finally to the seventh bowl in Revelation 16, verses 17 to 21. And once again, we have a great earthquake and hailstones will destroy the entire, write this down, world system. The world system that's been under the control of Satan and Satan through the Antichrist uh, is going to be totally destroyed. Uh, all unsaved people are going to be judged severely. Even though hailstones, huge hailstones are falling to earth, they're still going to refuse to repent. And the judgment of God is going to be so devastating that what's going to take place following is we realize that what's happening is a preparation for the coming of Christ to set up his kingdom on earth, his kingdom of peace and righteousness and justice and holiness, not the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of darkness, but the kingdom of peace, his earthly kingdom. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks called the millennium. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get out of the tribulation. <laughs> I'm thankful that we're not going to go through it, that we'll be raptured. But it is sobering to think. So just some things to wrap up with today. Uh, I, I'm struck with God's love for the nation of Israel even. Uh, as, you, as you go back and look at these scriptures, look at how Israel is weaved in here. The 144,000, the two witnesses. Um, uh, God, as it's said in the Old Testament, the, the apple of his eye is still uh, the nation of Israel. And he's still reaching out to them. And there will be those who will convert and, and recognize him as the Messiah. I'm also struck for, with God's love for the sinners, uh, even the unrepentant. He's still giving them opportunity. He's still trying to reveal himself that he's a loving but just God and that they need to turn to him even though they refuse to repent. I, I'm taken with man's refusal. How hard do our hearts need to become to refuse God's grace? How deceived people are and how sin has kept them so bound and how Satan has kept them so blinded that they would refuse to repent even through intense tribulation. And I'm also taken with the fact that Satan is very deceptive. And he has power, but his power is limited. And we're going to look next week as Christ comes back, how he will be chained and he will be restrained. We're going to look at how eventually he'll be thrown into the lake of fire with all his demons and the beast. And uh, he will never have opportunity to deceive, to destroy, uh, to tear down lives of people. And so our God is faithful. And so whatever you're going through, whether it's on a personal level, a struggle, a challenge, know this, that God will get you through. Through faith in Christ, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, He will deliver you from the wrath to come. You won't need to experience what we've just studied, the Great Tribulation. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you have a plan. Now, you are going to restore justice. You are going to restore righteousness. You are going to restore order as you intend originally intended in creating the heavens and the earth. And Lord, we know that someday there's going to come a new heaven and a new earth, that you're going to establish your kingdom right here on earth, and we are going to rule and reign with you. And, and that's all by your grace. And so, Lord, increase within us a desire to live as your ambassadors on this earth, to share the gospel, to uh, allow as many people as possible the opportunity to have their names also written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with me. Enjoy your study together in your groups. And we'll see you next week as we talk about the second coming of Christ. God bless you.